Welcome to this month's Speaking of Art talk. As you all know, thanks to a gift from John and Kim Shirley, the Seattle Art Museum now possesses a remarkable collection of sculpture by Alexander Calder. As you also all know, one of our favorite speakers on any topic is Rebecca Albiani. And today, <laughs> thank you. Today, the two things come together. Uh, Rebecca is here to give us her art history informed insights into the career of Alexander Calder, an artist generally acknowledged to have changed the course of sculpture in the 20th century. As always happens when Rebecca gives us her insights, we come away better informed and with an enjoyment increased because of the uh, insights that we have gained. So prepare now for that enjoyment, and please, again, welcome Rebecca. Thank you. We tend to think of Alexander Calder as a particularly fun artist, but not perhaps as a consequential artist. Indeed, Calder himself claimed that he had an enormous fan base, all of it under six. <laughs> uh, and yet, a, an, a critic of the middle of the last century uh, once commented that he felt the most important artists of his day were Pablo Picasso and Sandy Calder. And so now that we have this marvelous gift to celebrate, um, we might also rethink everything that we know or think we know about Alexander Calder. Seen here adjusting one of the sculptures that is now part of the Seattle Art Museum collection. It's not that Seattle was a Calder poor town up until recently. We did have this magnificent eagle in the Olympic Sculpture Park, also a gift of John Shirley. Uh, but now, Seattle is a Calder-rich destination. Uh, now, um, John Shirley um, has given four dozen works that he began collecting with his first wife, Mary, uh, and after her passing, has continued collecting with his current wife, Kim, um, four dozen works that um, really are making Seattle a destination for Calder studies, for Calder lovers. Uh, they are seen here with a maquette, um, a tabletop size sculpture that is a model for something larger that, um, that Calder was going to make. But you'll notice that Kim is wearing a Calder brooch. And there is no Calder jewelry in the bequest, which I think means that she wishes to continue wearing her Calder jewelry for the time being. So I won't talk much about his jewelry today. Um, but the exhibition that is currently on view um, on the third floor at Seattle Art Museum through August the 4th, so we have a nice long time uh, to go see it more than once, um, it includes all of the Shirley's gifts uh, to Sam. And so they will be incorporated into the permanent collection, but this is our opportunity to see them all at once, to really get a sense of the impact of this gift. Now, Sandy Calder, as he was known, was the third in a line of Alexander Calder sculptors. His grandfather, Alexander Milne Calder, sculpted the 37-foot-high William Penn uh, that still stands atop Philadelphia City Hall, as well as all of that subsidiary sculpture that you see up here um, and, and elsewhere on the building. 
And his son, Alexander Sterling Calder, was more of a realist than a neoclassical sculptor, here sculpting his three-year-old son, Sandy, as man cub. And Calder liked to say that he wasn't raised so much as framed. His father was a sculptor, and his mother was a painter, a member of the generation of New York City painters that we've come to know as the Ashcan School. So she was a good friend of Robert Henry and John Sloan and Everett Shin and those painters of, um, of New York life around the turn of the 20th century. Although Calder was born in Pennsylvania, his father contracted tuberculosis, which meant they needed to travel and settle in warmer climes. Uh, they spent time in Arizona. Uh, Calder would graduate from high school in Pasadena. Uh, but wherever the family lived, Sandy had his own little workshop with his own art supplies. And these are his earliest surviving sculptures, made at the age of 11 as Christmas presents for his parents. A dog and a duck, little figurines um, crafted out of sheet brass, and the duck is kinetic. It rocks. So he seems to have been traveling on this path set for him by his grandfather and his father, and yet he still resisted. We see him here at the 1915 Panama Pacific uh, International Exposition in San Francisco, where his father had been appointed director of sculpture. So that's Sterling's fountain at the left, and a young Sandy Calder, about 17 at the right, about the time he's deciding, no, I will not just go with the flow. I am going to decide for myself what my future will be. And so he went to New Jersey to study mechanical engineering and got his degree uh, in mechanical engineering, which I think helped him a great deal in his sculpting career. Uh, then he wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do with that degree. He took some odd jobs, one of which in uh, 1921 was in the boiler room of a steamship heading from New York City to S San Francisco. And off the coast of Guatemala, he had what he has described ever since as an utterly life-changing experience. He woke on the deck to find the sun rising in the east as a glowing red orb at the exact same time that the moon was setting in the west as a silver coin. And the, the realization of cosmic forces, that that vision of sun and moon um, excited in this young man was very powerful. Now remember that they didn't have the Hubble telescope. They didn't have our views of deep space. Calder said, I don't know what the universe looks like but I'm constantly trying to imagine it. And a great deal of Calder's art has that as its goal, to create a sort of model of the universe. And you know, this is a lithograph that is in the uh, show. Anything with the asterisk is in the, um, in the show right now, um, that he made some 40 years later, where he's still seeing and imagining and recreating in two and three dimensions that vision of the sun and the moon and the waves. So from San Francisco, he came further north to Washington State. His sister was married to a man in the lumber industry, and um, they lived in Gig Harbor. So Calder spent some months in a logging camp 
uh, helping with the, the cables and the pulleys, uh, the mechanisms involved in bringing down trees. And Washington State played an absolutely formational role in Calder's decision to become an artist. He felt so bereft of art in Gig Harbor <laughs> that he ended up fleeing back to New York City to um, throw himself into contemporary art. Uh, to train, in fact, as a painter, not yet a sculptor. He took classes at the Art Students League from old family friends like John Sloan and George Lukes, and he became, for a time, essentially an Ashcan school painter, crafting gritty, realistic images of New York City. He also got a job for the National Police Gazette, they sent him to various places, and he would produce every couple of weeks a feature with uh, drawn vignettes. So one of the places that they sent him was the circus. Calder spent a couple of weeks with Barnum and Bailey sketching the bareback riders and the trained seals and the trapeze artists and the like to produce this this feature, Seeing the Circus with Sandy Calder. And you can see that he's um, crafting these very simple, deceptively simple, line drawings um, to capture the various acts. And then he's tagging each one with a witty, uh, a witty caption, like gray matter under the elephant. Um, and this gets at the same thing that the dog and the duck did, his lifelong love of animals and love of depicting animals in um, two or three dimensions. So also in 1925, he published his first book, which he called Animal Sketching. It's not so much a how-to book as an inspiration book that is filled with his pen and ink drawings of dogs and cats and birds and giraffes and antelope and the like. Um, very expressive in the way he uses his line and captures the poses and you know, even the sly grins of the various animals he depicts. But around this time, he was getting more and more interested in sculpture. He carved his first wooden sculpture in 1926, this very flat cat. It's carved from a, an old wooden fence post. So it had to be fairly flat. He only had so much wood to work with, and yet he's captured that relaxed bonelessness of a cat, um, you know, maybe in a patch of sunlight. So around this time, Calder was uh, making sculptures that for American artists were fairly avant-garde. This is a good example, his woman from 1926, um, with its simplified masses, its smooth planes, the cropping just below the knee. All of those things seemed um, quite progressive for American artists. But this was about the time that Calder decided he needed to seek further instruction and inspiration in the center of the art world. He needed to travel to Paris. So from 1926 to 1931, Calder settled in Paris, where he learned that his wooden sculptures might look avant-garde in America, but not so much in Paris. He was exposed to the sorts of things that Sculptors like Constantine Brancusi were making. Brancusi's torso of a young man, essentially just three joined cylinders. And he befriended Brancusi and Giacometti and Fernand Leger and the really important 
um, participants in the Parisian avant-garde art scene. So the work that is at SAM now that is um, representing this period in his career and um, the Shirley's collected very consciously to get items that are good, um, uh, good representations of the various stages of Calder's career and his interests uh, is this seated woman, femme assise, made in Paris. Uh, again, you can see that it has some broad, simplified masses. Uh, here it looks like Calder is probably looking at African sculpture, just as Matisse and Picasso and Brancusi and other um, artists were in Paris. But this, this isn't the direction his work would continue in. That is perhaps suggested more by Calder's Circus, by this um, creation of his Paris years that began as something to do with his spare time and that was created out of found objects, essentially junk, corks and wire and bits of fabric, uh, paper, cardboard, etc. At first he could put his entire circus in one suitcase. But by the time he left Paris, it required five suitcases to house all of the um, components of his circus. And it wasn't just something that sat um, and was looked at. No, Calder performed his circus. Calder would make those um, trapeze artists spin and Calder would roar for his lion and move it around. Um, and you can see how charming the lion is. It looks very Oz to me. Um, but what is the platform that the lion is perched on? It's made from the cage of a champagne cork. Which, that's what everyone says, oh, of course it is. You don't see it immediately, though, because it mimics that platform so well, because he smashed it down a little bit to get a lower profile. But he's basically taking garbage and transforming it into this whimsical art that he is then um, putting on shows with for his friends, which initially meant um, putting some bales of hay in his studio so that people could watch him as he plays with these various things. But by the end of his stay in Paris, this was a major avant-garde spectacle. Um, Andre Kertesz was a Hungarian photographer associated with the Surrealists, and here he is photographing Calder manipulating his circus. Uh, and it was of great interest to um, even people like Picasso. So Calder um, rethought what sculpting could be and essentially invented performance art decades before that became a recognized artistic category. Uh, he was still doing two-dimensional work at times, and after he and his wife, they were married in 1930, um, after he and his wife um, returned to settle in the United States in 1931, he made a whole series of circus drawings, sort of commemorating his circus in two dimensions. And the drawings are single line drawings in, um, in many instances. So uh, some of the oddities of those two figures come from the fact that Calder has drawn them without lifting his pen from the paper. So the loop of the belt means that he's, you know, he's creating that line without lifting his pen. So uh, he's 
you know, going in, coming back, continuing that contour line. And uh, these were later redone as lithographs, and it is the lithographs that are in the Sam show. Um, so if you can take a single line and meander it into a figure, Calder thought, well, you could take a single wire and do the same thing. And so Calder began to craft objects like these cows. Ours is at the top, and tragically, we do not possess that coil of thicker wire that creates the cow patty that they have in New York City. <laughs> but it is still a, it's a charming sculpture, but it goes beyond charming because it is also a sculpture that is almost the opposite of what we think of when we think of sculpture. Sculpture is something massive solid, carved out of stone or wood or um, molded out of clay or wax and um, you know, poured into bronze and um, heavy. And Calder's wire sculptures are mostly air. They are mostly void. And so, um, they're not even all figurines. This is his Romulus and Remus from 1927, and it is 10 feet long. And it was in storage for a long time, and he brought it out for an exhibition in the 60s, and he said, huh, I always thought this was particularly amusing, but now it looks like good sculpture. And in fact, it is sculpture that radically challenges the idea of what sculpture can be. Here, sculpture is linear. And sculpture is mostly what our brain is creating of this image um, to, um, to fill in the, um, the story to fill in the, uh, the, the spaces between the lines, but he is taking on ancient Roman myth in something like Romulus and Remus. Uh, so he is interested in the whole history of art and his place in it. Um, he began sculpting portraits in the late 20s as well. And while these are necessarily somewhat um, abstract uh, or stylized, he manages to capture a likeness of someone like his close friend, Joan Miro. Um, and he was beginning to make jewelry in the late 1920s as well. Um, but I am not going to be showing you any of his jewelry except for this and the brooch on Kim um, because he himself didn't consider it to be in the same category as his sculptures. He, it was something that he made for his loved ones, his wife or uh, mother or daughters or something that he made when he needed cash. And so he could sell cufflinks or bracelets or earrings. Um, but I think that his jewelry is, is some of the finest high art jewelry ever produced. In 1930, Calder had another life-changing experience that he himself likened to that view of the sun and the moon off of his um, ship off Guatemala. And that was an indoor experience. He visited the studio of Dutch artist Piet Mondrian in Paris. And he said that he knew what modernism was but he only had a sort of fuzzy grasp of what abstraction meant until he was confronted with Mondrian studio, where everything was painted white, the chairs and tables and easel. And yes, there were Mondrian's characteristic grid paintings on the walls with their, you know, their white and black grids and their 
tr um, the rectangles of primary colors, but there were also just rectangles hanging in various places around the studio, some of them vertical, some of them horizontal, all of them there to give Mondrian inspiration for future works. And this had such a tremendous impact on Calder that he went back to his studio and did nothing but paint Mondrians for the next several weeks. And then he realized that these works, um, many of which still belong to the Calder Foundation, were derivative. That he really had nothing original to say with rectangular shapes in primary or close to primary colors um, on a flat canvas. But maybe he had something to say with abstract sculpture with wire in three dimensions. And so he began to create, in 1930, abstract wire sculptures. And this was a time when to be an American artist meant to be a realistic artist, a figurative artist, a naturalistic artist. 1930 is the year that Grant Wood painted American Gothic. And it was a year that Calder had his first show at the Museum of Modern Art as part of an, a group exhibition of um, important young artists. So he showed portraits, like the ones we see here, arrayed around the top of the room, and um, animals. Uh, and it was very well received. Uh, that was also the year 1930 when he married, he had met his wife on board a, a steamship on one of his crossings to and from Paris and New York. Uh, he was circumnavigating the deck in one direction. She and her father were circumnavigating in the other, which just made him think more about how his life was ruled by orbiting bodies. So in 1931, he has his first one-man show in Paris. He calls it Volumes, Vectors, Densities, Drawings, Portraits. And he showed this kinetic sculpture, but the rest do not move. Um, they are works like this one here, um, Croisier, or Crossing, um, which immediately suggests to us a planet, an orbit, a, um, a wire circle intersecting another wire circle, creating an equator. Um, and those painted wooden balls, although they don't move, bring to mind the idea of satellites. Um, of those forces of physics that rule the universe. And Calder began to think, well, why not make them move? Um, and again, think of how, how light these works are, how delicate, how see-through, how non-traditionally sculptural. And yet he goes a step farther by adding a motor. Uh, this is his pantograph from 1931, and we can see that, that that heavy base is that motor. And we can see some of the gears, and we can imagine how those wheels might turn and how the, the wire might, um, you know, might rise and fall and um, move those colored disks around but in a regular, repetitive way, in a sort of rectilinear fashion. And Calder was getting ready for his next one-man show in 1932, and he wanted some sort of a collective noun for these new moving sculptures that he was making. So he asked his friend Marcel Duchamp and Duchamp suggested, why don't you call them mobiles? Which in French means both mobile, mobile, and motive. 
So it's a bit of a, you know, a pun in French. And it's important to remember that that word, mobile, did not mean something that you hang over a baby's crib in 1931. It, as a noun, didn't really mean anything at all. That Calder brings that concept of object into being. So Calder was also developing objects that moved on their own. Um, because he felt that the motorized ones were a little too mechanistic. They didn't have the element of surprise. And so he started to make ones that would move by air currents or even by tapping. You used to be able to touch the calders. If you went to a calder exhibit in the 40s, you could spin the various elements. The curators do not let you do that anymore. Um, but this is, this is one where this object with red disks moves with the air currents in the room. And that adds the element of chance to the work. Uh, so it's no longer predetermined how those disks will move. Um, and chance was something that was of tremendous interest to early 20th century avant-garde artists. Um, Marcel Duchamp had made a work by dropping lengths of string onto a canvas and pasting them down. Jean Arp supposedly made this by um, dropping um, paper according to the laws of chance, but I think not just the laws of chance, or at least they would overlap a little bit. Um, but this idea of letting chance play a role in the artistic process was an important one in uh, 20th century avant-garde art, one that Calder would um, uh, incorporate into his own work. So this is one of his very last motorized um, sculptures, he called it a universe. Again, with the uh, intersecting circles of wire, we think about planetary motions, uh, we think about satellites and orbits, uh, but in this case, the motor is in that white base, so it's, it's much more subtle this time, and the motor um, goes on a 40-minute loop. So it slowly turns or shifts. Um, I've never actually seen this work in motion. But every 40 minutes, the position of all of the elements will repeat. And uh, when this was shown in New York City in the 1940s, Albert Einstein sat down in front of it and watched it for the full 40 minutes and then said, I wish I had thought of that. Um, but again, Calder wanted artworks that were not going to repeat every 40 minutes, that might repeat never. And so it, he abandoned the idea of the motors and increasingly made works that would be moved by the elements. And this is his first outdoor sculpture. Uh, he created this for the lawn of his uh, and his wife's farmhouse in Roxbury, Connecticut. As you might imagine, however, those slender legs did not hold up to the elements. It kept falling down in high winds, but that was a learning process for Calder, and uh, it did, you know, did get good action with uh, spinning the various elements before it fell over. Uh, so um, he continued to experiment um, with what worked and with what didn't, and. Um, what would be interesting and what wouldn't. Uh, Little Yellow Panel is another nod to Mondrian, to that experience in Mondrian Studios with the, uh, the rectangles everywhere, to Calder's suggestion to Mondrian that it might be interesting to make his rectangles oscillate, 
which Mondrian rejected, saying his work was already very fast. But here, Calder sets a little yellow panel, all, uh, oscillating, sets it in, in motion in a way. The panel never moves, but the three hanging elements do. Uh, three hanging elements that begin to look like what we think of when we think of the word mobile. Hanging from horizontal elements, um, you know, on long strings, the, the disc, the red irregular shape, and the two intersecting black and white irregular shapes. So it is in the 30s that Calder starts making the objects that we think of as mobiles. And this one is, is in the exhibit. It is made out of found objects, as was his circus. So the two upper left elements are white buttons of slightly different sizes, and the others are glass, uh, broken glass wrapped with wire. Uh, and the shadows become part of our experience of these works of art. So we're so familiar with mobiles. We hang them over cribs. Kindergartners make them out of paper and whatnot. That we have forgotten how radical this is as a sculpture. It's not even standing on the ground anymore, being heavy. It's now hanging from the ceiling and spinning around gently and almost ethereal and weightless. Uh, not all of his hanging sculptures are ethereal. Some of them are heavier in feel, like elephant, uh, with its white tusk-like shape piercing the red um, biomorphic shape and then a yellow uh, you know, blobby shape looking perhaps like an ear. It doesn't resemble an elephant, but it does evoke the idea of an elephant, albeit in children's book colors. Uh, but these shapes, these sort of irregular, curved, biomorphic forms were very much beloved of the surrealists, uh, who were the most important artistic um, uh, movement between the two world wars. Uh, so we can see such shapes in Calder's good friend uh, Miro, uh, like these intersecting shapes down here. Um, Miro uses them. Yves Tanguy used them. Salvador Dali uses them. And Calder is using them in his mobiles, but also in the works that he would call uh, stabiles. Stabile. Uh, I've heard them pronounced various ways, but I kind of like stabile. Um, as a counterpart to mobile. And this one is a devil fish. So again, it's suggesting an animal without illustrating that animal. And Calder hated welding. So his sculptures, even the eagle, even the very large ones, are riveted. They are held together with bolts, not with welding. Uh, and you can see the various, I always forget I have three screens, we could, you can see the various lines of bolts, um, then all painted black to give that unified look. Uh, in 1937, Calder took his wife and his two young daughters to Paris. Uh, to, to revisit his old haunts. And he found his dear friend, Joan Miro, working on this mural at, in the Spanish pavilion at the Paris World's Fair. 1937 was the year that General Franco prevailed in the Spanish Civil War. And so this pavilion was the Spanish Republican pavilion in exile. 
Uh, Miro was, uh, you know, a staunch Republican, staunch anti-Franco, and he asked if his friend Calder would be willing to make something for the pavilion. So Calder crafted this mercury fountain. And you can just see on the edge of the fountain the letters uh, D-E-N, the end of the word Almaden. Uh, the city, Almaden, had been brutally besieged by Franco's troops. So this was a memorial to this region that at the time produced some 60% of the world's mercury. So this is political art. Even though it's very abstract, uh, this is art with a social conscience um, that is in the exact same room and created out of these same circumstances as Picasso's Guernica, which you can see hanging right behind it. Uh, so it doesn't, it's not as overt as Guernica, but its heart is in the right place. Uh, Calder was increasingly called on by American arts institutions for his mobiles, for this new kind of um, radical abstract sculpture that moves and shifts and dangles. Um, and considering that this is just nine years after he had shown his cow sculptures at MoMA. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite an adaptation, both in Calder's own art, but also in American taste, uh, able to embrace this much more abstract kind of sculpture. Uh, so this was, this lobster trap and fishtail was made for a specific stairwell in MoMA, um, so that it would, you know, it would hang in a, in a particular place, in a particular way. Um, but um, his stabiles were still not being snapped up by museums or collectors. This is his Black Beast from 1940. And yes, it does look a little unfriendly. Um, but, you know, this, this, this work is now... Know, nine feet high, nearly, eight and a half feet high. So this is a large stabile um, that is moving towards a new concept of public art, but the public wasn't ready for the black beast the way it was for something like the hanging spider, which might be abstract. It doesn't look like a spider. It doesn't have eight legs, and yet it evokes the feeling of a spider or perhaps a web or prey or the very idea of hanging. And these works were delightful to the public, uh, even when they were unfamiliar. By 1942, the United States was involved in World War II. So Calder's usual materials of steel and aluminum were not available to him as a sculptor. So he returned to his lifelong habit of sculpting things out of junk, found objects. Here, some wire uh, and broken bits of glass and porcelain, making the scales of a series of charming fish that he made in those years. Uh, for human scale, uh, this is what it looks like in the gallery. And he returned to sculpting with wood because that was accessible during the war as well and made a series of sculptures that Duchamp christened constellations that aren't titled Big Dipper or Orion, but that nevertheless give the idea of... Um, related objects and how they are uh, arrayed in um, 
in relation to one another here, tied together with that red painted wire, um, some vertical, some horizontal, but we get a sense of movement even in that still object. And increasingly, he was combining his still objects and his moving ones so that his stabiles would begin to have a mobile element to them as well, like this bayonets menacing a flower, where we get those spiky black forms. Uh, again, a rare example of um, sort of roughly political art. Um, and then the, um, the mobile element, these delicate blossom-like um, petals that dangle from the end of that very long wire. After the end of World War II, Calder really took his place in the pantheon of important American artists. Uh, but all during World War II, Calder had been a key um, link between the Parisian avant-garde and the American, particularly New York art world, as so many European artists had, um, had escaped fascism, had fled Europe, and flooded into New York City, Calder knew most of them personally and could speak French and could help arrange for housing and you know, essentially be a sort of one-man welcoming committee for the degenerate artists who were leaving uh, Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, so he continued after the war um, with his strengths, and this is this should have an asterisk, uh, because this is one of the works in the Shirley uh, Bequest that he calls Gamma. So the very title makes us think of cosmic radiation. Um, and here he takes um, essentially two mobile constellations of Mondrian colored disks. Uh, but one of them he hangs vertically, and the other he hangs horizontally. Um, and they interact. This is the official SAM photograph of it, but I took a couple of pictures in the galleries, and you can see how important the shadow is, but even more how the work changes as you watch it. So here we're getting a kind of broad side of the lower, the vertical element, where we're seeing almost every one of those disks uh, straight on. So they look quite um, imposing, but really a minute or two later, it looked like this where everything is now seen obliquely, and it's so narrow, and it almost disappears. Um, but you can see in the shadow that those are disks. And it, it's fascinating watching this work, and you might watch it for hundreds of hours without all of the elements realigning themselves exactly the same way twice because of that element of chance. Uh, Bougainville is one of the most important works in the Shirley Bequest. Uh, it means Bougainville, it's just the French word for Bougainville. And of course, it's not uh, replicating visually that brilliant pink flower, but more the feeling, perhaps, of such a plant with its hoary, um, roots and uh, old gnarly vines represented in the black elements, and then the flowers perhaps represented by those very delicate white blossom-like uh, forms, of which I have here a, um, a close-up. Uh, in 1948, Calder made this uh, dispersed objects with brass gong, which adds something new to sculpture, uh, 
the element of sound. So this is about when John Cage was revolutionizing modern music by playing it with non-musical instruments, by using everyday objects to make sound that he considered music. And Calder thought, well, why not add sound to my art making? So I did not watch this particular mobile long enough to see the red ring, or hear the red ring strike the brass gong. But that's adding something else to your experience of sculpture, anticipation. You don't watch Michelangelo's David and wait for him to throw his stone. It's never going to happen. But you can watch this, and eventually, someday, that that ring is going to strike that gong. You're going to hear what sound this makes. Uh, so again, it's, it's radical rethinking of what sculpture is. Uh, Calder was still making his fun objects, making toys for his children and eventually his grandchildren, here crafting this whimsical rat. Um, which is a little longer than one would like to see in actual form, uh, but that is completely charming on its sort of tripod uh, red base. And uh, Calder was always interested in scale. So there is a whole display case at SAM of tiny objects. In fact, for his wife's 43rd birthday, Calder gave her a cigar box filled with seven tiny Calder sculptures. And wherever they traveled, she brought that cigar box. And she would take out each sculpture and put them on the nightstand or the vanity table. And that was what made her feel like she was at home. And Sam has the great privilege to have some of these, not, not the exact ones that were made for Louisa, but um, similar minuscule sculptures. This is one inch high. And yet it has the tripod base, it has the, the spinning element, it has a sort of muscularity to it, even though it's tiny. Uh, this one is much larger, three inches high. Uh, and here he includes the element of color with the yellow base and the red elements. Um, and this one is seven inches high. And I always think looks like a trained red octopus balancing something for a circus. Uh, but here he's combining those stable and mobile elements. Um, and the stable ones are still um, not bringing joy to the American public. Uh, so um, Black Widow from 1959 is at MoMA, and perhaps the name suggests it's really not intended to bring joy, um, but to be something imposing, to be something intimidating, uh, and in this case, very large. But it really isn't until the 1964 retrospective of Calder's career at the Guggenheim when his stables began to be more widely accepted. Uh, Calder was 66 at the time, and they put the big stables in the atrium, and they hung the more massive mobiles in that great central space. And then in the spiraling galleries in that Frank Lloyd Wright building, they put the two-dimensional works, the smaller mobiles and stables. Um, and it was um, ecstatically received by both the critics and the public of, uh, of New York City of the day. Um, so for much of the rest of his career, he would concentrate on 
stables and public art, and his mobiles would get larger and larger, uh, often intended for particular sites. Uh, this one is the largest mobile in the Sam bequest. He calls it Spiderweb. And although it has a 20-foot wingspan, it's painted white. And it seems more like snowflakes almost than like something massive and heavy. If you think about you know, a sculpture that's 20 feet broad, you'd think that that would be something bulky. Uh, but in this case, it's something almost ethereal, uh, something that dangles and spins above our heads. Uh, now, Calder and his wife were deeply involved in the anti-war movement in the 1960s. Uh, they were confirmed pacifists. And this lithograph is the exception that proves the rule uh, that Calder's art was uh, essentially apolitical. Here, he is overt in his empathy and support for the people of Vietnam. Um, but this is a really rare object in the um, whole history of Calder's work. Much more characteristic is something like this bird. Um, and there's a similar one at Sam, but I wasn't able to get a good image of it. Uh, so he had a friend. He'd been making birds, of course, since he was 11. Uh, and he had a friend who was a curator at the Museum of Modern Art who owned this fanciful Victorian birdcage with turrets and gingerbread and I don't know what else. But he couldn't keep birds in it because they kept flying up into the turrets and damaging their wings. And so it was just in his home, empty. And Calder thought that was tragic. So Calder made birds for his friend uh, out of coffee cans. Can you see the word cafe on that turquoise uh, tail feather? Or medaglia d'oro on this red one? They're espresso cans. Uh, and Again, Calder is taking discards, garbage, detritus, and turning it into really entertaining, delightful public art. Uh, throughout his career, he was frequently involved with performance for the stage, uh, with modern dance, ballet. He worked with Martha Graham, among other uh, choreographers. Uh, and, and he even choreographed his own sort of ballet where the dancers were Calder mobiles. Uh, there were no living um, creatures on stage, but the mobiles spun uh, along to a soundtrack. Uh, but this mobile, this uh, quite large and imposing one, was created for a ballet. So there would have been, I think there were three of these mobiles, and then there would have been dancers uh, beneath them, um, you know, making beautiful uh, movement, probably also dressed in primary colors. Uh, and I, this is the um, this is the official portrait uh, that Sam made of this work. Uh, but I photographed this from the fourth floor. The exhibit's on the third floor, but I highly recommend also going up to the fourth floor and looking down on it because you get a different view. You get closer to the, the blades of some of these mobiles. Uh, you get to really see how they're put together, uh, and you just get a different view in the way that Calder gave us a different view of what sculpture could be. Uh, Red Curly Tail is another of these works that combines a stabile and a mobile. And again, the stabile is a tripod form, one of Calder's favorites. Uh, this one, Red Curly Tail, is uh, apparently very popular with that under six uh, demographic. Uh, it sort of looks like a dragon with four limbs and tail and then um, 
those revolving um, mobile parts. Well, in the last decade of his life, Calder spent a lot of time and energy on his large-scale public art. Uh, this is our eagle in its original location, and I think we can all agree it looks much better silhouetted against the Cascades and Puget Sound, sorry, the Olympics and Puget Sound, uh, than it does in front of a bank in Fort Worth. Um, but this is the only time in his career that Calder was working with assistants. His earlier work is all done by himself. Uh, it's only when he's making much larger scale works um, that he began to use assistance. And this is about the time that the federal government established its percent for art program. So, so that a certain percent of every object uh, or of every um, building, um, a certain percent of the budget had to be reserved for public art which is how this flamingo came about for the General Services uh, Administration in uh, Federal Plaza in Chicago. So this is enormous, it's 53 feet high. Um, and I understand you just saw Barbie as a community. Did anyone spot the Calder in Barbie? When you watch it again, look at the Mattel building. There is a Calder right outside. I couldn't get a good image of it or I would have brought it in. Uh, so this is in the characteristic color that's come to be known as Calder Red. Does it look like a flamingo? I'm getting a lot of head shaking and yet, it does have some of the rhythms and some of the energy of Audubon's flamingo, perhaps the most famous American image of a flamingo. So it suggests, it evokes a flamingo, even if it doesn't illustrate a flamingo. Calder's last great mobile was designed for the East Building of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. And its architect, I. M. Pei, always intended for it to dominate this space, to really bring this space to life. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Calder did not live to see it installed. Uh, in 1976, at the age of 78, after you know a day of work and then having dinner at his daughter's house, he had a heart attack and died. So he worked right up until the last day of his life. He was never, never ill or infirm. Uh, his assistant, who was Matisse's grandson, um, supervised the installation of this work in the East Building, where it, you know, the building that it has really defined ever since. Now, when we think about the importance of an artist, we think about whether that artist was influential. And Calder had a tremendous influence in reshaping our ideas of what sculpture could be. That sculpture could be something lightweight. That sculpture could move, uh, inspiring kinetic artists from Tangley to Trimpen. Uh, but he even inspired artists that we don't think of as having anything at all to do with Calder. Artists like Micheline Thomas, the African-American collage artist and um, photographer who about a decade ago made a whole series that she calls her Calder series, posing African-American models with Calder jewelry and Calder rugs and mobiles and lithographs. Uh, so Calder's approach to art making has permeated through not just the art world, but through popular culture as well. When we hang a mobile above a baby's crib, that is an homage to Alexander Calder. Um, and when we consider that sculpture does not have to be something solid, that is an homage to Alexander Calder. Yes, he inserted 
joy into his art making. And in fact, a critic in the 1930s felt that Calder's major accomplishment was injecting humor into contemporary art. But Calder did so with a, with a sense of serious purpose. He knew that his work was delightful and whimsical and fun, but he also knew that it was radical and new. And I think we can be very grateful to the Shirleys for this major gift of Calder's to the Seattle Art Museum that will help us to stop underestimating Alexander Calder. Thank you. So I apologize, I've gone a bit long, but I am happy to take questions uh, or go back to any slide you'd like a second look at. And I have one. Please. I saw the documentary a while back before Horizon House showed it on Calder. It was great, but you brought a whole nother level to it, which I'm really impressed by. But my question is, were any of his mobiles signed? Uh, you know, I do not know if his mobiles are signed or not. Um, does anyone does anyone know that question? Is there a docent in the room who might know? Um, I do not know. I have never noticed a signature on a Calder mobile. But given that you might only see that one bit in passing momentarily, I might not have noticed it. I don't know. There was one that you showed earlier where in wire mm -hmm. where it almost looked like his name was done in wire. Yes. Yeah. Did yes. you notice that? Yeah. So, so that's um, why I wondered if others were somehow signed. I, I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. So yes, that, that he did do that. He did make a little wire calder that, that dangled from some of the mobiles. Uh, but those tended to be fairly early ones. Yeah. The pictures like this one, uh, where the white is uh, just a total blank screen, a white screen. And then there are pictures where uh, the light is causing shadows. Yes. And like there, right. And th they, they, they sort of provoke thinking and responding to the shadows. So my question is, is that deliberate uh, or is that um, just, well, that was the lighting in the place and we, 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 we couldn't turn the museum's lights on or off, so we took the picture uh, so as best we could. Are the shadows deliberate? Um, my belief is that when he started making this sort of sculpture that was light and mobile, that he might not have been thinking about the shadows. But once he started to exhibit them, he absolutely started thinking about the shadows as an element of those works, as something that multiplies the, the movement and the multiplicity of any of these works. So I think you know, after the very beginning, he absolutely is thinking about the shadows. And these works that are these photographs that don't have the shadows, these are the official Sam portraits um, made by Spike Mafford um, and beautifully done to eliminate any shadow. But that is not our experience of these works, the experience necessarily. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much for, oh, oh. thank you very much for almost ending with the um, enormous Calder sculpture in, in the IMP, in the East, Museum, East Wing of the National Gallery, um, which, is, it's mind-blowing, absolutely. Um, practically, how do you take care of something that's out in public space for decades? Mm -hmm. um, and what 
curators have to be doing what and when is it going to need repainting or, or other oh, chips it's, and so on? It's a marvelous question. How do you take care of a calder that is in a public space? How do you take care of something like this, which must get dusty? Um, it, it Very carefully. Um, <laughs> and I have never seen images of like I've, I've seen the people cleaning the Seattle Public Library, the downtown library, um, and I'm, you know, they've got their, you know, they look like mountain climbers, and I imagine that there's some similar thing for cleaning calders, but I, I don't know. Um, you definitely, the, the conservation team would have a plan for each of these works, and there would be scheduled maintenance, and then also, if one of those links were to fail, that could be fatal. Uh, so they would have to check, you know, periodically that each of the, the joins was still good, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, so, yes, I think, I think conservation is fascinating, and the, the people that get to actually work with objects are really lucky. Um, and I don't know exactly how, you know, do they, do they vacuum this somehow with a really long, gentle vacuum? I don't know, uh, but it's a fantastic question. So, and I see a bunch more so questions. I have a Am question. How did he learn about the science of movement and balance? How did he learn about the science and movement and balance? Remember, he was a mechanical engineer. He, that was his undergraduate degree. So in mechanical engineering, they did a lot of movement and balance. Um, a lot, you know, he, he learned about movement and balance when he was working in, in a logging camp and was involved with, you know, felling trees and the cables, the pulleys, everything. Well, that was in Gig so, Harbor. Early, um, early. In Gig Harbor, exactly. Uh, so he, um, it, was, it was something that, he, he studied that he would, he would later minimize the importance of his engineering degree to his art making, but I think we can all see that there's a lot of mechanical engineering in a Calder. Um, so there's a question in the far back over there. There's one right here with a microphone. Yes, uh, it, going back to the shadows, I noticed that the walls, uh, including this one is an mm -hmm. off-white, but are basically, and the pictures are white, and uh, uh, different colored walls might have other effects of on the shadows. Uh, did he have any uh, say-so or uh, in the installation of his works as to what the backgrounds would be? Um, did he have a, a, a say over the backgrounds of the works, the walls, um, yeah. the walls yeah. when they were exhibited? Yeah. I would think that sometimes he did, and sometimes he didn't. When a collector buys a work, he, does, he has no um, say-so over whether they're going to put it against a purple wall and it's going to look just awful, well, or... Um, but or, might, um, the shadows might not show up And the either. shadows might not show up if it's on a, you know, he, you could have a very dramatic black wall in a resident space, and I think a Calder might look quite good on one, but you would lose a lot of that play of shadows. So the, the white walls are something that developed in the 20th century, that, that we began to expect museums and galleries to have white walls. Uh, to be neutral, exactly, which was not what you would have expected in, say, Monet's time um, or the Victorian era or what have you. Um, so there, there, there is kind of that expectation. But after the works are sold, then he would not necessarily, you know, he might have, he might have say, he might have, um, he might be consulted for his exhibitions on what the, gallery would look like. Um, he might even be consulted by curators at museums, but private individuals would not necessarily have to uh, take his advice. He could, he could recommend. 
Are there any contemporary artists that are trying to carry on this style, or is this the end of the style? Um, are there any contemporary artists that are trying to carry on this style? Uh, I think there are. I have seen works in galleries, and I'm not, um, like nothing is coming to mind um, immediately as to an, an artist that is carrying on in a Calder tradition, uh, but there are definitely still artists that are making things that hang rather than, you know, sculptures that hang rather than sculptures that stand on the floor. Uh, there are definitely contemporary artists who are making works of art that move and def uh, you know, performance art has become a major um, contemporary art form. So his uh, example continues to persist, to have influence. Uh, yes? I thought it was a shame at Sam that they couldn't set up a fan <laughs> to make those <laughs> objects move. You are not the first so. person I have heard say that it's a shame that Sam doesn't have a fan or some sort of directed spurts of air at the objects. Um, uh, yes, and they very much discourage blowing on them well, for obvious I, I public got, health concerns. I got caught blowing on a small one. Um, and actually, the curator didn't stop me, but I drew a crowd of crowd watching this crazy lady, old lady, oh. blowing her face <laughs> through, trying to get us to move. Um, yes, in the back. Hi. Um, I had the good fortune to be in New York City back in 1976, and one of the reasons was to go see the Sandy Calder exhibit, which turned into a retrospective, a retrospective. that weekend, because he had just died days before. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to see the entire circus. And, oh, wow. Uh, but my question is, and maybe I'm not remembering this correctly, so maybe you can help me out. I haven't really looked through picture catalogs, but I remember a uh, combination uh, as it stabia and uh, mobilia, mm -hmm. uh, there were large iron, uh, what should I say, bowls, different sizes and mm -hmm. densities on the floor. And above was a mobilia of bongs, many of them. And the public was invited, and I was one of them, to go through and move one of the bongs, and it in turn would move other bongs. And as a result, the lower hanging ones would play by chance, would, would play by chance some melody or something on the, the bowls below. It was magical. Yeah, I would imagine it was magical. I can't imagine it being shown whimsically because it's difficult to mount. Yes. Very difficult. Yes. But that is, that is a calder. Was I, I, remember I believe that, that sounds like something from that, that era where he was experimenting with incorporating sound into yeah. his work. Um, we, we saw the one work with a brass gong. Um, I don't know the particular work that you're referring to with sort of brass bowl or, or metal bowls and, and moving gongs, but it sounds like a calder. Um, and there was a show not that long ago where they fixed the motors of several of his early motorized works. And... Um, and also had curators come around and, and spin some of the non-motorized ones at, you know, if, if you were there at Tuesday on, you know, on a Tuesday at 2 p.m., you could see you know, this work move. Um, and that might have also been called Calder in Motion, but probably not. Um, but um, there are some videos online of some of his works in motion. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs>